our next guest today is Kathy Wood. <laughs> Kathy, uh, unfortunately, could not uh, join us in person, so she's joining us remotely. Uh, Kathy is the founder and CEO of ARK Invest. Um, Kathy, can you hear and or see us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Ah, amazing. There we go. All right. Yay. <laughs> Uh, dramatic entrance. Um, <laughs> let's start the uh, conversation with your current assessment of the Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, you guys were uh, the first fund, I believe, uh, on Wall Street to buy into the Grayscale GBTC uh, fund, but now we have ETFs. And so how do you think it's going? Uh, well, I, th I think uh, by all accounts, is going very well in in the aggregate we're thrilled with uh our our positioning um and actually somewhat humbled i must say um uh so i think we're number three um if you take out grayscale so um very happy with that uh very happy with the reception and you know, I think the interesting thing that happened when you have 11 uh, ETFs approved at the same time, that's never happened before, uh, the amount of energy and uh, research communication that has gone out uh, around this spot Bitcoin ETF opportunity um, you know, has been unmatched. And I think, uh, I think it's done a great service, uh, for, for Bitcoin and digital assets generally, because this is just the beginning of a completely new asset class. Now, one of the reasons that people are excited is because Bitcoin's price is going up. Um, some of that is because there's a lot of people going into the Bitcoin ETFs and so demand is outstripping supply. But there's also a number of other macro factors. There's questions around interest rates, around inflation, about a potential recession incoming. How do you evaluate uh, Bitcoin in light of these potential questions? And also, why are people buying the ETFs? Is it just the ETF alone or are there macro factors that are driving them to buy it? Well, as I, as I just mentioned, I think I think there's been a, a lot of communication about what Bitcoin actually is in this new asset class, uh, leading the charge. I know that our research team, I know Yassin is there with you, um, has done an amazing job, uh, not only in the last six months or year, uh, but we've had research extending back to two. 2014 uh, and so uh, and and our first white paper in 2015 when we took our first exposure uh, and so we've been singing the praises of bitcoin for a long time as a new asset class so that's a start but i do think there are some macro factors i know mike uh, mentioned this earlier we're very focused on what's going on in the emerging markets uh, right now i think um with time uh, many more people will understand that the Fed, with the 24-fold increase in interest rates over little more than a year's time, has absolutely shocked the financial system around the world. Now, many people are looking at very short-term lagging economic indicators here in the United States, primarily because the Fed is doing that. But if you look at other signals out there, there, um, there, there are um, um, signals that uh, not all is well in the world. I know Mike mentioned the the Nera, <clears throat> the Nigerian Nera, um, which has devalued tooth by two thirds since uh, last June. Now Nigeria is one of the wealthiest countries, oil rich in in Africa. And um, with a new administration that's become very business friendly, I think they thought they could let the currency float. And um, uh, and they found out, you know, that it has been very painful from a purchasing power point of view and from a wealth point of view. Um, we've seen the same uh, in Egypt that the the Egyptian devaluation was 40 uh, percent at the beginning of March. 
so I think I think that there's a bit of a risk off reason for owning Bitcoin emanating from the emerging markets we've seen in Argentina with the new administration there. I, I think the, the the currency, I mean, they made official what the black market already knew that the currency was worth half of what it w was reported at Lee worth. So I think we're getting those warning signals. I also think, you know, yesterday we got the Swiss bank cutting rates, which was a big surprise. The UK turning a little more dovish, the Fed now a little more dovish. Why? What are they seeing out there? Um, and so many people think of Bitcoin as a risk on asset, and it certainly has traded over, uh, like that over time. Uh, but we have been looking at it as both risk on and risk off. Uh, and I can tell you when we first, uh, when we first learned that in 2015, uh, when we took our first position in uh, Bitcoin via GBTC, Bitcoin was about $250. And many people were making fun of us at the time, thinking, oh, they're, they're new. We had just started our funds in October of 14. Oh, they're new. They're just trying to gain attention. This is a marketing gimmick. And so we were really on the spot. First of all, we had done a lot of research. We didn't think, uh, we thought there was real investment merit, but we were watching like a hawk its moves. And it, back then, uh, Greece was threatening to leave the European Union. And every time there was a flare up, uh, you know, and, and a fear of another European sovereign debt crisis, Bitcoin inched up. And so we've been looking at it as both a risk on and a risk off asset for quite some time. And the regional bank crisis last year uh, kind of uh, confirmed uh, our, that point of view that here Bitcoin um, more than doubled, I think more than doubled as regional banks were imploding. So uh, I think many people are beginning to say, as they learn what this is, wow, could it be both a risk on and a risk off asset? We think so. Now, one of the interesting things is uh, individuals and maybe family offices have been really excited about Bitcoin being outside of the system, kind of this alarm system that you're talking about with issues within the traditional financial system or the banking system. But what happens if Wall Street becomes a bigger player within Bitcoin? It's kind of pulling Bitcoin into the system to some degree. And so does that change the evaluation you have of the asset or how you think the industry actually develops in the coming years? Well, it's certainly going to be adding more liquidity. And that's good for price discovery. Um, I think it's legitimizing this new asset class. Uh, so that's a very good thing. I think bringing in a new class of investor is important. And, you know, one of the reasons that we wanted to do a Bitcoin uh, ETF, even or a spot Bitcoin ETF, even after um we dis we decided that it would probably be very low fee given the way the competition was going to evolve was you know we're looking at uh bitcoin as you know the technology as well it is you know a financial super highway a public good uh and so we think uh educating and offering access to as many people as possible uh, in a less friction filled way. I mean, many people just didn't want to deal with, you know, uh, wallets and so forth is uh, is is going to, in hindsight, uh, and when history is written, I think is going to become a very mo important moment in time. Now, you mentioned that a lot more liquidity will lead to or help in price discovery. Um, there's a school of thought that as these large pools of capital come in and the asset gets larger, uh, volatility will dampen and returns will actually go down. How do you think about the asymmetric return profile of Bitcoin historically and will that continue in the future or does that change now that there's new players and larger pools of capital? Well, asymmetric, I mean, uh, uh, there aren't many assets out there that uh, I think can claim that they're both risk on and risk off. So uh, for that reason, um, uh, we think that uh, the, the, the return profile is going to be uh, certainly relative to anything else out there. You know, uh, Yasin and, and team have done the returns to, uh, to Bitcoin um, 
I think this, yes, is over the life of Bitcoin or um, I forget exactly. He'll he'll tell you the the period of time that we did we put in our big ideas, uh, 2024. Um, and if you look at Bitcoin's compound annual rate of return, it's 44 percent over that time time versus I think it's four and a half percent for all other assets combined. Uh, so we think the superior returns uh, uh, are going to be there. This is the beginning. This is just the beginning of this new asset class. Um, yes, and the volatility is coming down. Um, as we look at, uh, are we going to have the same returns from peak to trough going forward? Perhaps not, um, but uh, we've come a long way and, and we still think we have miles to go. Are you all doing anything different since you first bought or has it pretty much been Bitcoin is good, ARK is buying, holding, and that's the strategy when it comes to Bitcoin specifically? Um, well, since we first, we were looking for exposure very early on, and the first exposure we could find was GBTC. But then, as time went on, um, of course, uh, public companies uh, uh, became available with some exposure to uh, to Bitcoin. Um, Coinbase, uh, actually, we had done our first, no, our second white paper with Coinbase when I think it was either doing it Series A or doing it Series B. Uh, so, you know, we were casting far and wide uh, for exposure to Bitcoin and we didn't have a private fund at the time like we do now. Um, so uh, Bitcoin, uh, Coinbase is now uh, obviously a big part of our portfolio, Square as well. Uh, Robinhood. So um, we're we're looking for the companies that could potentially have that uh, that digital wallet that is um, probably going to become a winner take most opportunity. And so you've got Coinbase coming at it from the crypto angle. You've got uh, 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 Robinhood coming at it from well, starting with equities and options and uh, Square with Cash App. So, um, yes, we're we're doing that. We also have launched uh, some um, futures funds. Uh, uh, I think that's pretty well no known, three of which are actively managed. Uh, so one is Bitcoin Cash, uh, one is Bitcoin ETH, and these are all futures. And then one is Bitcoin and all of these digital wallet uh, opportunities, potentially. Uh, and then um, we also have uh, private funds, a cryptocurrency fund, a crypto revolutions fund, which will, you know, which will take us far and beyond Bitcoin. So we're doing a lot and getting more and more excited about it. And uh, we now have four, uh, four people, uh, including Yassine, focused uh, on this space. And one of them, uh, I might add, is David Puel. Many of you may know him if you are in, into on-chain analytics. Uh, some of them are named after him because he created them. We hired him uh, because... Uh, uh, we can tell a lot about the market. We do a Bitcoin monthly piece examining the health of the network and where we are in the bull or the bear market, what phase we're in. We believe we're kind of in mid phase right now based on on-chain analytics. And on-chain analytics also help us with our trading strategies in active management. You mentioned Coinbase. What's the investment thesis for a company that obviously is the most kind of regulated, well-known brand in the United States, but why buy the stock here and, and what do you think the future holds for them? Well, we were buying it when uh, regulators were torpedoing it or attempting to at least. Um, we post our trades every day and um, um, uh, I think many people were very surprised to, to see us buying when uh, Coinbase got the Wells notice and the stock price went down 20 or 30 percent. And then again, when the the, the SEC sued them, um, Coinbase is the most regulatory compliant exchange in the world. Uh, some of its competitors have gone out of business, FTX, of course, being an important one. Uh, Binance has had its share of issues as well, uh, CZ having to step aside and the fines and so forth. Um, and Coinbase is now going international, very importantly. 
Uh, and uh, I think as as uh, as the trusted um, company that it is here in the United States, I think it will catch hold uh, in uh, in the rest of the world. We're seeing it with an offshore derivatives um, exchange, which is taken off and is doing, I think, a lot better than a lot of other people expected. And then we've got base. Uh, you know, they've uh, got an underlying protocol, which is generating organic demand with millions and millions of people already on it uh, compared to and, and you know, it doesn't have its own token like FTT or BNB. Uh, it's truly organic demand. So uh, I think it's got a lot going for it. And again, you know, it's a, a great way to capitalize on a new asset class that um, that is going to create a new class of asset managers. We're all going to become power users uh, as as we participate in this ecosystem, we're not going to be, you know, as much the I mean, we call ourselves an active manager. But uh, as you say, we, you know, buy and hold a stock if we really like it. Uh, we'll get to do a lot more in this ecosystem as uh, as an asset manager. So that's pretty exciting as well. And Yasin and his team uh, are really gearing up, uh, gearing us up nicely for that. When you look at Coinbase, do you feel like um, it could compete with the banks in terms of you know taking a hundred percent or a very large portion of uh, wallet share, um, or is it something that's more akin to competing with the PayPal's and kind of payments, or maybe it's something that would be competing more with like a Charles Schwab and like an investment account? Like where where does it kind of slot in from a competitive standpoint with the legacy players? Today's episode is brought to you by Supra. If you're building anything in Web3 or crypto, you likely need oracles and verifiable randomness too. Supra's offering the fastest oracles and DVRF free for 12 months at supra.com slash pomp for a limited time. Supra delivers the freshest oracle price feeds across 50 plus blockchains. Be it current critical price levels or liquidation triggers, beat your competition to the punch with Supra. It's as good as having the first mover advantage on every price update. Supra is more secure, easier to integrate, and runs on up to 12x lower gas per feed than other oracles. So you'll want to bank on this 12 months free offer as soon as possible. If you're just listening and know any builders, you can earn $1,500 by letting them know about this deal. They can get the fastest oracles for free for 12 months, and you get $1,500 for every referral. Visit supra.com slash POMP to learn more. That's S-U-P-R-A dot com slash POMP. Well, I think I think all of the above, uh, right? Um, and and we'll see over time where 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 it has the most success and where it chooses to to focus. Um, but uh, we think it's a very big idea. That's why we own it. It's the top stock in our um, in our flagship strategy, uh, even bigger than Tesla now. And you know how positive we are on Tesla. Now, Tesla went up a lot. People are very excited. Uh, people are expecting Bitcoin to go up a lot. They're excited before it's even happened. Um, but one of the big questions is, will the four-year cycle persist? We obviously broke a number of rules, including we went below the previous all-time high. We're now at an all-time high before the halving. How are you thinking about four-year cycles and or big drawdowns now that these new players are in the market? Um. Uh, so you're asking me, are, do we have a lot of weak holders and is this going to disturb the cycle after that, the halving? Is is that the nature of the question? We can call them weak holders. I like that better. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, and you know, we're, we're trying to educate the, the new holders, but by definition, you know, they, they haven't been doing this as long as we have. And so innately, they, 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 pro they are not going to have the confidence that we have that this is a new technology, a new asset class, a new monetary system, uh, three very big, each a big idea uh, it, unto itself. Um, so... Um, as far as the having, I think what we're trying to do in, in terms of education, uh, as we have this new investor base, is say, you know what? For the first time, uh, the 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 supply growth of Bitcoin, uh, it, as it drops from 1.9 percent per year 
to roughly 0.9% uh, per year um, come April, uh, it's going. It's hitting an important milestone. Um, the the supply of uh, gold has been growing very long term, on average one percent. So now, I mean, it's just marginally, but it is below the su supply growth uh, of gold. So um, we're we're trying to use that um, to uh, help people understand a lot of the reason that gold became such an, a successful asset class is because the supply growth was fairly controlled, especially relative to uh, money growth out there in various regimes, in, including our own. Um, and uh, and so I think I, I don't see any reason why the halving won't be won't cause the same dynamic that it has in, in the previous cycles, especially as we're going out there with that message. Um, it doesn't happen right away, April and boom, uh, and it, it usually doesn't happen that way. So maybe they'll develop some impatience. But um, uh, we think that it. Um, it emphasizes one of the core features of Bitcoin and the reason it is uh, a, a risk off asset as well as a risk on asset. How are you all thinking about the Lightning Network, um, some of the layer twos or some of the side chains, things that are being built on top of Bitcoin? Yeah, um, well, it's interesting to watch some of the, uh, the layer twos, Optimism, Arbitrum, uh, maybe taking some share here. Um, I think that the Lightning uh, Network demands too much collateral. And so, uh, you know, this is a very uh, creative and uh, uh, a, a creative community and they try and find workarounds and, and those seem to be finding some success. Uh, so, but, you know, one of the things that in terms of the Lightning Network that's been fascinating. Um, actually, this was on one of our Bitcoin brainstorms. We do a Bitcoin brainstorm every month. Uh, I think we've done it for seven months now, Yasin uh, and uh, and the team with uh, Bitcoin Park. I don't know if you know Rod Ruby from Bitcoin Park, but we do this once a month. And uh, the, the second one we did was just Mind blowing to me. Uh, I was wearing my economics hat, the emerging markets. I understand about those as well. But there's a convergence between artificial intelligence and uh, uh, Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network that's taking place now. And it's taking place in the emerging markets. We had, for those of you who know the uh, the the people involved in in the uh, Lightning Network. Um, his name is Roast Beef. He's one of the developers. And he was telling us uh, in, in Africa, what he was witnessing was, you know, a, a completely new division of labor. Um, we've gotten used to gig economy, that concept here in, in the United States with Uber and Airbnb and, uh, and other things. Uh, but you can turbocharge that into micro, uh, the micro gig economy and uh, uh, AI agents using um, the Bitcoin network through Lightning. So um, it's happening. But as 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 so much is when it comes to Bitcoin, um, we're not seeing it as much here as in the emerging markets where, you know, there's more of a need. What about the mining businesses? Obviously, you all um, really understand Bitcoin and, and are enthusiastic. Are the mining businesses more or less attractive? And, and how do you think about them put in the portfolio? Well, we don't own any mining stocks. Uh, we have a very strong point of view on on what many people criticize as the environmental damage that uh Bitcoin mining is doing. You know, it's interesting. I remember the dawn of the internet. Um, maybe not the John Dawn. That was DARPA, and I didn't have anything to do with it. But as as it was beginning to commercialize, and we were beginning to understand what it was, 
Um, there was a big controversy back then as well. Do you know how much uh, uh, electricity the internet is taking uh, or using? This is this is terrible. It's so wasteful. It's for criminals. It's for uh, pornography. It's for uh, all of this stuff. So this this typically happens uh, with uh, with uh, innovation. Um, many people think it's for nefarious uses and. Uh, and they do not see the, the the bigger picture. I think the same is true here. And we did a seminar, I think it was in 2020, um, it was right after Tesla had put Bitcoin on its balance sheet and received a lot of criticism about uh, the environmental damage uh, that Bitcoin was doing. And so with Jack Dorsey and Elon, we pulled together, it was a half day seminar. I think, it, I, I know it's still up somewhere. Um, and at that time, we had written, we had done some research saying, wait a minute, you know, whether, you, you know, utility ecosystems could um, could use Bitcoin mining for a very important purpose. That is all of the energy that's wasted when storage units are filled with power from the sun or the wind uh, use that 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 excess and put it into Bitcoin mining and then overbuild solar and wind. And that's exactly what's happening. The other thing that's happening that is fascinating is um, Exxon, uh, ha I don't know how much it's rolled out, but I know it had six, it put Bitcoin mining machines into six natural gas fields around the world um, be, and and basically, instead of flaring or venting the gas, and venting is much more uh, damaging environmentally um, than flaring, uh, they put it to use in Bitcoin mining. And, uh, and now companies, I know Caruso is another company doing this. So uh, we actually, I, I think if, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, I think already Bitcoin mining is uh, the the energy use is more than 50% renewable and now is contributing to building out that uh that ecosystem <clears throat> How are you thinking about uh, Block, formerly known as Square? Uh, they recently, um, or last couple of years, made a big push into Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of their revenue numbers seem to be tied to Bitcoin purchases at certain times. And now they've also come out with a hardware wallet. And so I know you guys have uh, been excited about that business and maybe the investment thesis there. Uh, you mean Block altogether or the Bitcoin uh, or the, the wallet? B both work. Okay. Uh, Sure. Uh, you know, it's been fascinating to watch this two-sided market uh, uh, system uh, uh, platform. Um, you know, in the beginning, we we did our very early research uh, on this and, and we were tracking where uh, where Cash App was having success relative to, to PayPal. Uh, that was its main competitor at the time. And we saw that if you mapped uh, where it was having success, it was in lower income areas. And um, and uh, so uh, and and it was growing virally. Uh, and part of the reason was this merchant consumer two sided marketplace. Uh, so it was very early on. In fact, I remember back then, uh, in the same quarter, Jack Dorsey and Mark Benioff talked about this concept that there would be no difference between consumers and businesses. And I, I heard them say it in the same quarterly call. And so it was like, wow, OK, what's going on here? And so as we traced this, we said, oh, OK, this is providing services to the unbanked for, in the case of Cash App. Uh, and uh, peer to peer, uh, and 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 enabling merchants um, to uh, because Block can see every second of the day how well a merchant is doing because most of the payments go through it. Uh, it was then able to help these merchants build their businesses 
give them working capital loans, give them, you know, uh, loans to make new capital investments. Uh, um, and then it got into payroll. And then, of course, now it's offering consumers who stay within its network very low cost uh, banking services. So this is an ecosystem that's evolving. And you can see that with Bitcoin, this is a little bit of a Trojan horse. I know a uh, block or square, as it was called at the time, was just running into one regulatory obstacle after another as it tried to enter new markets. And it basically said to heck with this and uh, is using Bitcoin now to get into um, other markets. In fact, it's sell or shutting down or maybe selling off uh, some of the properties properties it bought in Europe in order uh in order to do this. So I think um I think this is the you know the world of offering uh access to financial services broadly and as as broadly and as inexpensively as possible and going global doing it. And you know it's very interesting when we try and again this is all about education explain to new investors what this movement is. Um, in the words, I'll use Chris Berniski, who was our uh, first analyst uh, in 2014 on Bitcoin and went on to write a book. I think he published it in 2017 called Crypto Assets, the Innovative Investor's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. Um, he recently um, is helping to bring to life I'd like to think his arc roots helped him because he's bringing to life for, you know, the average investor. What this really is, this is the Internet financial system. Really, that's all this is. The developers in the early days of the Internet did not uh, expect any financial services or commerce. In fact, the Internet was illegal for consumers to use in the 80s. I remember that. And um, and then email was connected to the Internet in 1993 and uh, and and it and it took on a, a new life. But we still didn't expect no one was going to put their credit card on, even when people were trying in those early days. I remember saying I wouldn't do it. And of course, you see see what's happened. Well, what really should have happened is developers should have added in a, a, a lay a, a, a layer uh, for financial services native to the internet. That's what blockchain technology is. That's what it is. It's as simple as that. And uh, so it's a very big idea. It's a global idea and a company like Block, and some of the other, and of course, Coinbase, um, they understand this. Um, it's a very big idea. Um, think about how big the internet is now, and it has miles to go because we've just begun. I, I appreciate your time. We're sad that you couldn't be here, and we'll definitely do it again in the future. Next time. Yes. Thank you so much for, for letting me do this online. I'm, I'm really, really honored to have been a part of this. All right. We'll see you later. Okay. Bye, Pomp.